Today we have a new toy to test. This is a 180 MHz dual channel portable scope. It's the FNERSI TPOX180H. I'm not going to talk much about the specs in this video, but I'll put a link down below to where you can find the scope and read all the specs. Instead, I'm going to share my experience of trying it out on a real vintage computer project. And what better project than a cursed Commodore PC-10? So far we have found and fixed more than a dozen faults on this battery bomb board. And it still doesn't even post. In other words, it's perfect to test the new scope. I gladly accepted the scope for several reasons. I'll tell you in a minute. But first, let's get it out of this box. I have already seen it in Dave Jones' review. So I know it's pretty good. That is one of the reasons why I gladly accepted the scope. So we've got a charger, USB cable, we've got two probes and a manual. It looks pretty good. It's in multiple languages. I'll read through it and talk more about the manual later. And then we've got the scope, of course. So let's unwrap it. Okay, first impression, it's quite lightweight. I was expecting it to be heavier. And overall, it feels quite solid. Let's check out that stand. That's pretty good. Let's check if it's charged. Yes, it is. Great, so we can start using it right away. According to the back of the box here, the standby time is three and a half hours. That should be more than sufficient for what I do. So the first reason why I wanted one of these is because it's so handy. I often move around on the bench when I work on a project. And instead of unplugging and moving my fancy scope, I can just grab this one. And since it runs on batteries, it's ready to use. No need to unplug the cord underneath the bench and plug it in on the other end of the bench. By the way, it starts really quickly. Unlike the DH0800, this thing fires up in a couple of seconds and is ready to use. The next thing I notice is that the display is really good. Viewing angles are quite impressive and that is actually quite important on a portable scope. Another good reason to use a portable scope is when working on high voltage stuff. Since it runs off batteries, this is much safer. The third reason is that on many of my projects I just need to check the basics. So I actually rarely use the fancy features of my DHO800. This scope here is probably going to be good enough for 90% of my projects. And the final reason is that it's much easier to get on camera. For you guys to see what I see on the bench scope, I pretty much have to connect it to a PC and record. But with this handy little scope here, I just need to keep it within frame and poke around on the board. That is a huge time saver. Okay, I had a quick look through the manual and it seems to be pretty easy to use. So I have it hooked up to the clock on the Commodore PC-10 board. So let's turn it on. So we've got volts per division down here. And H for time base. And here's our clock. And T down here for trigger. And then we have this move button here. This is a very nice feature. By pushing on it, we get much slower movements. And it makes the scope much easier to use. So that's a very good feature. In the menu here, we've got all the useful stuff. Uh, down here we can jump down to channel 2. Press OK. And press OK again to disable it. And to store the settings, we just need to use this button here. And go all the way back. And now we have less clutter. 
The clock is running at roughly 7.15 megahertz, so it seems okay. But let's go back to the menu, uh, down to channel 1. Choose channel 1 and press OK again. And then we can go down to voltage peak to peak. Turn it off and choose voltage peak instead. Press OK and store with this button here. And then go back. And we can see that the clock is perfect logic level. I said it before and I'll say it again. That is a great display. Unfortunately I'm getting some reflections on camera here. It's not a problem in real life here. But on camera it's a bit of a problem. Okay, scope seems great. Now let's start poking around on the board. And see if we can find a fault. We have already checked all the basics, so we know the board is running, but it doesn't complete posts. And it doesn't display any graphics. But let's check them again, just to test the scope. Okay, board powered on. I'll change the scope to 1 volt per division. And move the trace down. Okay, let's start with VCC. Uh, we are getting 4.8 volts. That's close enough. Next we have the resets. I'll turn the board off and turn it on and it should jump up briefly and then go down again. And it does. So scope is definitely quick enough. Unlike some software we have tried previously on this board. Next we have the ready pin. And it seems okay too. We have already checked the clock. So we know it's okay. Next up is all the address lines. That one definitely looks okay. So I'm just gonna check all of them and skip ahead here. Unless I see something weird. But this is definitely looking good. And the remaining address lines on the other side of the chip. Okay, so we can clearly see that the board is running. But unfortunately it doesn't complete post. For whatever reason, it gets stuck. In a previous video, we found some really strange signals on U104 up here. It's an LS245 buffer. It's upside down on the board here. So we've got the A pins on the right side and the B pins on the left side here. So if we check the pins that are connected to the CPU, we can see some normal signals as expected, because it's connected directly to the CPU. On the left side we have all the B pins. Oh, that's different. It's stuck high. At 4.7 volts. And this pin too. Yeah, all of these pins are stuck high. So something has changed on this board. Interesting. So, in the previous repair attempts, we got those really slow rising weird signals. I'll put a picture on the display here. But now they're just stuck high. This chip here is pulled up high by this resistor pack here. So that means we have nothing coming through this chip. That's interesting. Uh, something has changed. Well, in that case, let's check the direction pin. Well, it looks almost normal. I would expect much longer on states. So I can't quite tell if that signal is correct or not. This pin here allows data to go through, either in this direction or in the other direction. In that case, let's check the enable pin. Well, we actually have data on this pin too. But not much. So it is sending some kind of signal to this chip. But not much. So I'll say this is our next suspect. Okay, let's check the schematics. So here is our U104. And both the direction and enable pin are both going to the FE2010. I can't say for sure if it's faulty, but the signal it's sending to U104 has changed. 
since we did the previous repair attempt of this board. And that suggests a bad connection. By the way, I'm using a different probe. Uh, that is because I have a long ground strap on it. I did a quick test with the probes that came with the scope. And they are just fine. Well, I've actually had quite a few comments suggesting that we should replace the socket for this chip here. So I guess I will indulge you and replace it. Since it is our main suspect at the moment. Well, I can't see anything obviously wrong with the chip or the socket, but there was quite a lot of corrosion in the socket when I found this board. So let's go ahead and replace it anyways. There's also this interesting contraption here. Don't know what it does, and I'm not sure if it's in a socket or if it's soldered to the board. I guess we should find out. Well, it doesn't move. So I think it's soldered to the board. In the silk screen it says PC10C OCS tower. There's a 74F32 and a crystal. So maybe it's providing a clock for either of these two chips. If you're new to this project, this board had some massive battery damage. I have pretty much replaced all the components in this entire corner here. And quite a few other components all over this board. We have checked them and many of them were bad. We have also repaired about 30 broken traces on this board. So it's quite a bloody project. I never had to replace one of these sockets before. So let's see how this is done. It's quite close to the damaged area here. So perhaps we'll find some broken traces underneath that socket. I'll start by applying some fresh solder to all the pins. They seem to take solder quite easily. So this solder here doesn't seem to be corroded. Some of the soldered pins were so bad on this board. I actually had to grind away the solder. So this board is pretty extreme. Okay, all the pads took fresh solder easily. Now let's remove it with a desoldering gun. Okay, I just had some drama off camera here. My desoldering gun just stopped working. It suddenly became very, very weak. Too weak to get the solder out. So I took the whole damn thing apart and checked everything including the pump and everything seemed to be working turned out to be the bloody nozzle so my smallest and mid-sized nozzle apparently are completely worn out luckily I have this large nozzle still unused so when I tried it everything works perfectly it's obviously way too large for these small pins. But at least now it's working. And I can use it while I order and wait for new nozzles. So as you can see, this is working really well. The solder is coming out of those through holes very easily. So no corroded solder on the socket here. Well, at least now I know how that thing works. <laughs> Maybe I should have disassembled it on camera. There were actually two pumps inside. By the way, I'm using a ProSkate desoldering gun. I've been using it for a few years now, and I'm really happy with it. Wearing out the nozzles is probably normal. So if you're having a problem with your desoldering gun, Maybe it's time to replace the nozzle. Okay, I only had to reflow two of the pins. And now all the solder is out. Next I'm going to use the rework station to melt the remaining solder. But before I do, I'm going to heat up the entire board. Because if we only heat a small area of the board, we may end up with a bent board. 
So I'm going to heat up the board with a regular heat gun for about 60 seconds. Uh, now that the board is nice and toasty, we can heat up all these pads. And whatever solder is left in those through holes, it should now melt. And we can then remove the socket, without risking damaging the pads. I'm not going to use any force to get that socket out. I'm just gently going to push on these pins. And whenever it's ready to come out, it's going to pop out. And here it comes. Oh, this glue is melting. <laughs> Okay, just drop down on the bench. Now let's see what damage we have underneath. No, that's not too bad. Uh, I was kind of expecting to find some corrosion underneath the socket. But that looks pretty good. And all the pads look fine too. There's just the tiniest amount of solder left and a couple of the through holes. So I'll remove it before I clean the board. I'll use some solder wick and a large tip. I might as well clean up all these pads. They look a bit crusty. Yeah, that looks much better. So now we can clean these pads. I'm using a Q-tip dipped in IPA. And I clean it while it's still warm. That way it comes off much easier. Okay, nice and clean. I cleaned up the other side of the board too. So now we can install the new sockets. And minding the notch here, we can now install it. I'm going to apply some deoxide on the chip and let it do its magic while we solder the sockets. I'll start by just soldering two of the pins. And then I'll make sure that the socket sits flush to the board. And now I can solder the remaining pins. That is quite a few pins, so I'll skip ahead here. Okay, let's clean up that mess. And see if this made any difference. I'm gonna clean all the legs of the chip with my scratchy glass fiber pen and make them nice and shiny again. The scratchy pen leaves some dust on the chip. So we better clean that stuff off too with some IPA. And for good measure, I'll apply some more deoxide on all the legs. And I think it's ready to go back in. Okay, let's fire up that board. And check those pins again. So let's start with pin 1. And this pin is for direction. That looks pretty pretty much the same. Now let's check the enable pin. No, that looks the same too. So unfortunately, that wasn't our issue. That sucks. So how about this side of the chip? No, it's still not passing anything through. It's just stuck high. Well, that socket may or may not have been bad, but it definitely didn't solve this issue here. Well, in that case, why did the signal change from the previous repair attempt? Well, in that case, I'm gonna pull this chip. This is a brand new chip, by the way. I guess it could still be faulty, but it's not very likely. And then I'm going to bend B0 and reinstall the chip. And now if we measure A0, we have what looks like a correct signal. Now let's see if the chip passes it through. Huh, now it's just pulled low. So is this a faulty chip? Uh, it's actually not quite pulled low. It seems to be stuck at about one and a half volts. That is so strange. Well, I guess we could just try and replace it. Maybe it has gone bad. Okay, brand new 74LS245. It's not tested, but I got it from Mauser, so it's probably fine. 
Okay, the board is running. Uh, we're getting a signal on A0. Uh, let's check B0. No, it's stuck high. What could possibly cause this? Okay, we did something similar in a previous video. But since something has changed on the board since then, let's do this again. So now I have pulled the direction pin low. So if we compare A0 to B0, it's still not passing anything through. So let me try and pull this high instead. Okay, pin 1 is now pulled high through a 10k resistor. Okay, let's see what we get. Okay, that's strange. We are getting something, but not what I was expecting. Yes, we are now getting a signal on B0, but it should have been identical to A0 here, and it's not. What's going on? Does this chip have proper power? Let's check VCC. Yeah, voltage is okay. We are at 4.7-ish. How about ground? Yeah, that chip is powered. Okay, let's bend another pin. Okay, it's getting a bit messy here. But now the direction pin is pulled high through a resistor here. But now also the enable pin is pulled low. Okay, so A0 passing through to B0. Yeah, that looks right. How about those pins that aren't bent out? Yeah, that looks right too. So this is what we're expecting. If the Faraday chip does what it should, but put all the pins back in, this is what we're getting instead. So that indicates that this is not caused by a short on the bus. This has something to do with the signals coming from the Faraday chip. I'm not 100% sure, but this is how it seems to me. So either we have a bad Faraday chip, or something else is causing it to send wrong information to the LS245 up here. Well, I don't have a spare Faraday chip. So in that case, I'm gonna go for the BIOS next. The Retro Web has quite a collection. There is a sticker on my BIOS that says 4.36. So I'm going to download this, mostly for comparison. There is a B and a C version of it too. So I guess we'll compare it to those files too. And then we are of course going with the newest version here, 4.41. Let's start by reading the contents of the BIOS chip on the motherboard. And these are 27C256 EEPROMs. Now let's read the content of that BIOS chip. Read successfully, okay. Now let's load up the downloaded BIOS version 4.36 and verify it against the content of that chip. Uh, no, it didn't match. So let's load up the version B and verify. And same thing here. The content of my chip doesn't match this BIOS. So let's load up the C version. Uh, do the same thing again. No, it doesn't match. So maybe we're lucky and the content of my BIOS is damaged. Let's pull that chip out and install another chip. We might as well go with the latest version, 4.41. So let's program the EEPROM. I'm gonna program this chip a few times. Sometimes it's not enough to program these chips once. This is the original socket, so I haven't replaced it. I hope that's not a mistake. But let's at least use some deoxid. Before we install the new chip, I'll pull that chip in and out a few times in case there is some oxidation in that socket. Okay, let's turn the board on 
and see if this made a difference. So here's our A0, and here's our B0. No, still stuck high. So this problem isn't caused by the BIOS, but the content of that BIOS chip was probably bad, since it didn't match the file we found online. I found this crystal in the schematics, and it is indeed for the Faraday chip. According to the schematics, it should be 28.6. So let's check it next. I can't access the pins underneath. So let's try these. Oh, there it is. And it is indeed 28.6. Okay, so the Faraday chip runs at the correct speed. Okay, next up I want to try out the Supersoft Landmark Diagnostic ROM. It's designed for the IBM XT, so it may or may not work, but let's give it a try. Power on, and we should get some beep codes. And we do! Okay, great, I'll count those beeps and check what they are. Well, that totally sucks, according to the manual. That's the math code. But we don't have one installed. So if I'm counting correctly, we've got two long beeps and then eight short beeps. That makes me wonder if this could be a compatibility issue with NEC V20. So let's install the original CPU. Unfortunately, it's untested, but I think it's worth a try. Since we're getting error code for the math code. Here goes. Oh, a different code. I'm curious to see if that EEPROM can make this board display any graphics. Let's give that a try. Hey, that was two different sets of beep codes. Let me check. Well, I've got quite a few different beep codes while rebooting the machine. One of them was the keyboard. Let's try with a regular XT keyboard. Okay, 2 plus 9. That is actually still the keyboard controller. I'll test again off camera. Yeah, that was definitely a keyboard error. So let's try with an original Commodore keyboard. This is not the keyboard that came with this machine. But this is what I had easily at hand. This keyboard here looks like a cheap copy of the FXT. But the keyboard that came with this machine looked more like a cheap copy of the Model M. But it's worth a try. Still a keyboard error. Well, I guess I better go and look for the original keyboard. Okay, I got it. Let's try again. Yeah, still the keyboard error. Well, I'm pretty sure it's this chip here, but let me check. By the way, I'm not sure if this graphics card is compatible with that diagnostic ROM. So let's first do a quick test with a proper IBM card. Here it goes. Yes! Wow! So the board is definitely running. I know it's not much, but this card hasn't displayed any graphics in decades. Finally, the Commodore PC-10 is doing something. And, of course, we've got a couple of arrows here. We've got U34, 82.53, timer channel 1, and 16K critical memory region. I don't have much experience with this software here, but we're getting some more info here. Failing bits, 1 through 7, and it has stopped beeping for the keyboard. So now we're getting error 2 plus 4 and 2 plus 8. 2 plus 4 is non-maskable interrupt. And 2 8 is the math co. Well, that is kind of bad news because U34 is a timer chip in original XT. But this board doesn't have one of those. So that's probably a part of that Faraday chip too. And the error we got is pointing to channel 1. 
which is assigned to DRAM refresh, since we also get RAM errors. So this kind of sucks. Okay, things got interesting off camera here. Since the diagnostic ROM is pointing us towards the RAM, I decided to check all the pins off camera, since we have already checked them in a previous video. And they all used to be good, but not anymore, so we have a new fault on this board. So D in is stuck at 1.5 volts, and address line 3 and 5 are gone. So we have a new fault. So here's bank 0, and all these RAM chips are connected to these three LS158s. And that's these two guys here, and this one over here. They are brand new, so they are probably okay. But then the signals are moving on to this page here. And they are connected to U104, 5, 6 and 7. And that's these guys here. So U104, 5, 6 and 7. We have already replaced this chip here. But I think one of these three chips here has gone bad. Since we made a previous repair attempt. These are, by the way, the original chips that came with this board. I have installed them in sockets and tested them in the TL866. They checked out good, but I don't trust the TL866 as a chip tester. So it only makes sense to replace these chips. Oh no, this sucks. These are 74LS373, all three of them. And I don't have even one, so we're stuck. That sucks. But I have to say, it's really encouraging to finally see something on the display. After all these attempts to fix this cursed board. And the new scope is great, it's now one of my favorite tools. Well, I'll order some more parts and we'll try again. If you're watching this in the future, there will be a link to that video on the screen shortly. If you're watching this fresh, hit the bell icon below and set it to all. And now is a good time to watch the previous repair attempt when we also tried out Rigol's new DHO800. I will end this video by saying thank you to my patrons. I appreciate your support. If you want to support me too, consider becoming a patron. Patrons get ad-free early access. If you want to help me make more videos like this, like and leave a comment. If you're a regular viewer, consider subscribing to this channel. Thank you for watching, I'll see you next week.